Okay. All right. Happy Fat Bear Week, everyone. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about Fat Bear Week, which usually runs the first week of October, um, culminating in Fat Bear Tuesday. And we'll get into exactly what that means in a bit. Um, but Katmai National Park and Preserve calls Fat Bear Week an annual celebration of success. Why is essentially outlined in this video. So let's take let's take a look. Welcome to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. This is one of the best places in the world to watch brown bears fishing for salmon. It's also one of the most exciting times of the year because this is Fat Bear Week, a celebration not just of fat bears, but of a healthy, robust ecosystem. Follow me, Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with explore.org for a quick tour of Brooks River and the places where bears go to survive and thrive. After a multi-year journey, salmon return from the ocean to spawn in fresh water. The river is their final destination. They will die after they spawn, sacrificing their lives to reproduce. Salmon are an incredibly important food for Katmai's brown bears and the source of most of their annual calories. In early summer, Brooks Falls creates a temporary barrier to migrating salmon. Here, bears have learned that they can satisfy their profound hunger by waiting for fish to come to them. Skilled bears can catch and eat nearly 100 pounds of salmon per day. In late summer and fall, as salmon spawn and die, Bears scavenge fish in other parts of the river, especially near its outlet at Naknek Lake. Brooks River is a profitable place if your currency is calories. No other place in Katmai provides bears with the opportunity to catch salmon for so long. Because they hibernate through winter, bears need to eat a year's worth of food in six months or less. And a bear's transformation from summer to fall is remarkable. In a few weeks, bears will begin to enter their dens, located at secluded places in the nearby mountains. Inside the den, they will not eat, drink, urinate, or defecate. By metabolizing their body fat for energy and hydration, they continue to subsist on summer's bounty throughout the winter. Bears get fat to survive. A fat bear is more than just a successful bear, however. It's a symbol of the healthy, productive, and rich ecosystem that is Katmai National Park. Welcome to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. This is one of the best places. Just go to the next slide. Okay. <laughs> so that essentially summed up my entire talk. Um, but but getting into more detail, essentially prior to their winter hibernation, um, these bears eat lots and lots of salmon and get really fat. And so Katmai National Park Rangers and naturalists have decided to pit the bears against each other and allow the public to vote for their favorites essentially promoting the park and um, their partner, explore.org. Uh, winner is crowned fattest bear on Fat Bear Tuesday. And you can participate by voting for your favorites at um, explore.org, put it in the chat. Um, voting has been occurring every day since Wednesday, starting at 11, 11 central. Um, yeah, Amanda, inside Amanda, I love 747 also. Um, but something really fun is you can also watch the bears live. They have several cameras set up at Katmai uh, around Brooks Falls. Right now it's just showing highlights 
peak viewing time is going to be um, mid July. Um, right around this time is when the salmon have kind of reached their final destination, and now the bears are more getting ready to hibernate or scavenging. Um, but explore.org also has tons of other live cams. This is something. This is a tool I used to use when when I taught. Um, but they have lots of lots of great stuff. Um, they have like bird feeders in Costa Rica. That's one of my favorites. And and puffin cam is also another one of my favorites. Um, but anyway, getting into bears. Um, before we get really into brown bears, a cat my and fat bear week, I wanted to talk a bit about bears in general. Um, so bears come from this family Ursidae. There are eight extant species, um, and they are large terrestrial car carnivores concentrated in Asia, Europe, and the Americas. So these are our bears. We have um, our native uh, North American bears, brown bears, American black bears, and polar bears. We have a single South American species, the Andean bear or um, the spectacled bear. And then we have several other bears that are um, distributed across Eurasia, including the same brown bear that's native here uh, in North America, pandas, sloth bears, sun bears, and the Asiatic black bear. There are three subfamilies within Ursidae. Um, you have Oloropodinae, which are just our giant pandas. There's a lot of debate on whether we should classify pandas in their own in their own subfamily um, of the bears for various reasons. Um, one of which being their many um, morphological similarities to red pandas, for example, which are classified in a totally different family outside of bears. Um, but they are the single species within that subfamily. Um, and then we have spectacle bears in this family, which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. Um, and then most of our bears fall in Ursinae, including our, our brown bears that we're going to talk about. Starting with We'll go, we'll go by continents, so starting with, with South America. We have the spectacle bear or the Andean bear. Um, these are native to the Andean mountains. And they're the only extant bear species um, native to South America. Um, they're called spectacle bears because they have these, these dark eye patches that make them look like they're wearing spectacles um, in a way. Uh, they're mostly arboreal, living in, in cloud forests in South America and primarily herbivorous. All of our bears, for the most part, are omnivorous. Um, some of them like to be more vegetarian. Some of them are meat eaters more so. Our spectacle bears are mostly herbivorous, consuming cactus, bromeliads, palm fruit, um, moss, and orchid bulbs. Moving into Eurasia as a whole, um, we have giant pandas which are endemic to China. They have an extremely small range um, and they are folivores. Um, again, like all of our bears, they have the potential to be omnivorous, but these are, are strictly vegetarian bears. Um, folivores are herbivores that specialize in eating leaves. Um, and as we're all probably familiar with, they eat bamboo shoots. Um, they can consume up to 20 to 30 pounds per day. Uh, they're primary sol primarily solitary animals, and they are crepuscular, meaning they are most active um, around dawn and dusk. Something really interesting about pandas that contributes to this, this bamboo eating tendency is they have this thumb, um, which is a modified seismoid bone that helps them hold the bamboo. Essentially, a seismoid bone is a bone that's embedded within a tendon or muscle. And an example in humans would be our, our patella. Um, but this, this modified bone essentially allows them to kind of hold the bamboo in that, that groove so that they can consume 
all the little shoots off of it. Then we have sloth bears. Sloth bears are endemic to India, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and Nepal. These bears typically travel in pairs and primarily eat termites and ants. Um, they have long claws that are sickle shaped um, that allows them to kind of dig into these, these termite mounds and ant nests um, and then their muzzle, they use their muzzle to suck it up. They also like to eat mangoes, jackfruit, honey, um, and these, these bears are occasionally preyed on by Bengal tigers. Not super common um, just because of their size though. Sun bears, one, one of my personal favorites just because of how weird they look, um, are endemic to tropical forests of Southeast Asia. They are the smallest bear um, of those eight bear species. They're mostly arboreal and they are diurnal, meaning they're most active during the day. They have a super broad diet, but what they're really known for is this extremely long tongue, which is really great for sticking in places and extracting things like insects and honey. Uh, the last bear we'll talk about from, from more of the Asia region is the Asiatic black bear, which is endemic to most of Asia. Um, and they're, they're really distinct because of these, these very round Mickey Mouse type ears. Um, they're omnivorous. They eat lots of insects, beetle larvae, other invertebrates, termites, grubs, carrion, bees, eggs. They love garbage like our American black bears, um, mushrooms, grasses, fruits, nuts, seeds, honey, herbs, acorns, cherries, uh, dogwood, and grain. Um, they will occasionally kill and eat ungulates. Um, again, not super common. They like the American black bears. They prefer to eat something easy. Um, something that doesn't move like all these, these uh, herbivorous type stuff or easy to grab insects or garbage. Um, and again, like, like our sun bears, these, these bears are diurnal. So getting into our North American species, the first one we'll talk about is the American black bear, which is um, the only bear that you can find here in Wisconsin. Um, they are endemic to North America. They're omnivorous and they have a super, super keen sense of smell. It's seven times more sensitive than domestic dogs. Um, we could probably have a whole background now trail just on, on black bears. They're very cute and fun. Um, but today focus is brown bears. Um, something fun about, about black bears is they come in a wide variety of coloration. They're not just black. You can have typical black bears, but they can also be this like more chocolate brown color. They can be blonde. They can kind of be this like gray or what, what um, is referred to as more of like a blue color. Um, it's, it's quite a spectrum. They're not just black bears. And, and the same can be said for, for grizz or for brown bears. Um, but we'll get into uh, how you can just differentiate the two. We also have polar bears, um, which are endemic specifically to the Arctic Circle. These bears are hypercarnivorous, meaning they primarily eat meat. Um, they're the only primarily terrestrial animal that is considered a marine mammal um, because they do spend some of their time out at sea. Um, and they're the largest bear. These are the bears that you really don't want to run into. Um, they do tend to be a little bit aggressive, um, whereas black bears, for the most part, are kind of shy unless they're really habituated to humans. Brown bears, it can vary a lot. Um, brown bears, brown bears are endemic to both North America and Eurasia. Um, whether or not these two groups are different species uh, is another topic that is kind of highly debated, as well as 
whether brown bears and, and grizzly bears are subspecies, like grizzlies are a subspecies of brown bear. Um, we won't get into all of that right now, but just know that, that when people refer to grizzlies, they're referring to brown bears. Um, typically, grizzlies are, are um, the brown bears that you find more away away from the coast, more more in in central North America. Um, they're very smart. They have the largest brain of any living carnivore relative to their body size. Um, and and a testament to how smart they are, they have been known to use tools. Um, they'll use tools to dig insects out of places, all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, they are primarily solitary. You'll see a mother with her cubs. Cubs stay with their mother for about two years, um, but you typically won't see brown bears together. Um, Brooks Falls is, is an exception to that. Um, that's somewhere they gather in large places. And I know this is true in, in Europe as well. Brown bears are known to gather. gather um, I remember this this documentary that I watched. I don't remember which one exactly, but their brown bears in Europe are known to gather around um, landfills. Here in Katmai, they're known to gather around the falls. Um, essentially, they'll gather around around really nice food sources, um, but they're not. They'll interact in a social way, but not one that is necessarily um, nice. Distinguishing our, our black bear from our, our brown bear or our grizzly bear um, is, is relatively easy, even though both come in this like this variety of colors. Um, brown bears tend to be larger, at least in terms of weight. Um, something very prominent about, about brown bears is their short rounded ears, whereas black bears have more tall pointed ears. Um, and then brown bears and grizzly bears have this, this very distinctive shoulder hump that you can see. Um, which brings us to brown bears at Katmai National Park. Katmai is located in Alaska and by area, Alaska houses more than half of the US national parks. We have 23 NPS units, um, including Katmai. Katmai is the fourth largest US national park with um, over 4 million acres of land. It's huge. Um, this is Katmai. I won't get into exactly what, everything about it, um, but it's primarily, wilderness. Um, not a lot of it is developed. There are a few places like Brooks Falls um, that see a lot of visitors, um, but like many of the Alaskan national parks, um, they don't get nearly as many visitors as, as places like Yellowstone or Yosemite. As I mentioned, Katmai National Park and Preserve is about 4 million acres. Um, Something really interesting that I learned is there are 14 active volcanoes within Katmai. Um, it is one of the world's most active volcanic areas. Um, and this is because it's located along the northern boundary of the Pacific Ring of Fire. So it comes out on that, that Alaskan peninsula um, and is at that northern, that northern tip of, of the Ring of Fire. Um, there are 42 species of mammals and many other species of birds, fish, um, insects, etc. cetera. Um, but some of these, these mammals include our brown bears as well as gray wolves. And it is the home of Fat Bear Week. So there are a couple of players when we, when we talk about Fat Bear Week, one of which is the river itself. Um, Brooks River is one of the largest and healthiest runs of sockeye salmon left on the planet. 
Um, and the falls itself, where, where we'll often see bears concentrated and where like that live cam is, is focused and where a lot of our NPS rangers are focused when they're studying the brown bears um, is essentially a temporary barrier for the salmon. Um, they have to jump from the lower part of the river to the upper part and it kind of concentrates them in this area, which makes it really great fishing grounds for the bears, very easy. Um, plentiful. The other player uh, is our sockeye salmon. They are anadromous, meaning they hatch in freshwater and then migrate to the ocean only to return to um, spawn and die. They're semiparous, meaning they, they die after spawning that one time and they're on this four year cycle. Um, Pacific salmon in general uh, follow this four-year cycle where they hatch and then they're out to sea for three-ish years and then they come back to their natal streams. Um, in June or July they start making their way back uh, which is why like that that live cam is really great to watch. Prime, prime viewing time is, is in July because that's when our, our salmon are making their way back. Salmon are interesting when, when they return to their natal stream. Um, when they're out in the Pacific, they start out um, looking like a, a normal fish. But once they start making their way back, um, switching from, from salt water to fresh water, they stop eating. Um, this journey is very energy intensive. Um, so essentially, they their body kind of eats itself from, from the inside. Um, they lose their scales. They turn this, this really interesting red color. Males tend to develop a hooked jaw and this, this hump, um, which is um, a sexual selection type trait where it, it's more interesting to the females and it indicates that they're ready to spawn. Um, but once they, once they spawn, they die and that's it for them. Then our final, our final player are our brown bears, which again, just a summary here, um, very smart, solitary, native to North American Asia. Bears at Katmai are monitored by um, National Park Rangers and Naturalists. Um, they've been observing the bears since 2001. That bear week only started in 2014. Um, essentially, they'll go out to this observation tower or some of the other um, observation decks along the Brooks River and just watch the bears. They note the number of bears present. Um, they identify individuals, document their characteristics, behavior, count the number of people watching them um, and try and age slash sex them. Age meaning just, are they a cub, a subadult or an adult? Um, they don't, they, they can estimate in years how old the bear is, but sometimes that's kind of difficult unless you have the bear in hand. They are assigned a number, a number for monitoring and research purposes. Um, and what's, what was really interesting to me is they rarely ever go in and tranquilize a bear to get data on it. They primarily, or to tag it in any way, they primarily use just distinguishing characteristics and behaviors to identify these bears. And you'll see that when we get into who, who are our fat bears this year. Um, yeah, so they rarely ever step in um, to actually have their hands on a bear um, unless there's an interest in collaring a bear for like a movement ecology study or to intervene in, in the welfare of a bear, um, which has occurred and we'll talk about. How many bears use the Brooks River themselves? Um, last year, 76 unique bears were recorded using the falls during the salmon surge in July. And that number 
has has grown since they started monitoring. Um, initially, they had only they only saw maybe around thirty bears, and so it's grown significantly over the years because it's such a such an important and plentiful food source. So we'll get into the bears themselves, but first. I want to show you essentially what I'm referring to when I say bears like to fish in this spot. Um, so this is the falls, uh, which is primarily where uh, most of these, these observations have been made by the Park Service. Um, we have the lip of the falls, which is like the very top. Um, very few bears fish there, but there are a few that are really good at it. Um, then there's the jacuzzi which is right under the main part of the falls. Um, it is a extremely productive spot um, and highly sought after just because of how they tend to crowd around there before they, they, they'll jump. Um, then there's the far pool way in the back. Um, Nothing super interesting about it. It's it's typically occupied by bears that are less tolerant of humans. Um, that is the, the observation tower is essentially, you can imagine you're looking out, you're standing on the observation tower right there. So the farther away for some bears, the better. Um, and then further downstream or upstream, less dominant bears tend to hang out. Um, upstream more so uh, after the main salmon run, uh, downstream bears tend to scavenge. Okay, so who are our fat bears? This is our fat bear week bracket. It's changed a little bit um, since voting started um, on the 5th, but we'll look at each individual bear and then I'll show you who's been doing well. Her first bear is 32. Chunk, he's an adult male, and he is one of the bears that fishes in the jacuzzi in the far pool. He's one of the most dominant bears uh, at the falls. And these are some of his identifying characteristics. For me, one of the most identifying characteristics um, is this scar that he has on his muzzle, which you can't see very well in this picture. But he's up for a vote today. You can see it a lot better. In this picture. Then we have Grazer, who's one of my favorites. She's an adult female. She is one of the bears that is very skilled at fishing the lip of the falls. Um, so just like catching them in, the, in her mouth while they jump. Um, she has this, this blonde coat that tends to darken in the fall. Uh, then we have Walker. He is an adult male. He's one of the largest bears on the Brooks River, estimated to weigh around 1,000 pounds. Um, and his identifying features this year, he has this wound on the side. Um, and he has these upright and wide set ears. 164 is an adult male. He has a very unique fishing spot. He's one of the younger bears. Um, so he's not super dominant, but he likes to stand on the edge of one of the deepest plunge pools. And as the salmon well up from, from below, they're either jumping or they're falling. If they missed um, the jump, he'll take advantage then and there. Um, which no other bear has been observed doing. Um, his, one of his most identifying features is these darker legs. He has a lighter coat um, with darker fur in his lower legs. Then there is 335, who is a sub-adult female. She is the daughter of 435 or Holly, we'll talk about next. Um, She's one of those bears that's very young, so hasn't found a fishing spot um, at the falls, but will scavenge partially eating their spawned out salmon downriver. Then there's Holly, who is another one of my favorites. Um, she's described as looking like a toasted marshmallow. Um, 
She's an adult female and was the 2019 Fat Bear Champion. Um, she has these light brown ears and she tends to get really fat. Um, that bear in the video that was, was sitting upright and like scratching itself, that was Holly. Um, and she's kind of funny. Then there is a fan favorite for 80, Otis. He is one of the older adult males. He prefers the jacuzzi. He's the four time fat bear champ, having won in 2014, 2016, 2017, and last year in 2021. Um, he's got these cute floppy ears. Um, one of the more distinguishing features is he's missing two of his canine teeth. So he's very clearly older. Um, and he also has a, a kind of unique way of fishing, which we can watch. At Brooks Falls in Katmai National Park, bears gorge on salmon in their attempt to sate their profound hunger. I've seen a lot of bears catch a lot of fish at Brooks Falls, yet it'll be especially challenging for any bear to match the success and hunger of Otis on an evening in early July 2016. Emerging from the forest, perhaps after a long nap, Otis entered the water and soon caught several salmon. As a patient and experienced angler, he had no trouble catching more. Otis didn't stop at 10 salmon. He powered through his 15th fish and he kept going at 20. Not even 30 salmon were enough to satisfy his appetite. When I left the Brooks Falls wildlife viewing platform at 10 p.m., Otis had caught and eaten 35 sockeye salmon. Incredibly, he wasn't yet done. Bear cam viewers tallied Otis catching seven additional fish for an amazing total of 42 salmon in a sitting. Otis did not target small fry either. Each sockeye probably averaged about five pounds and contained about 4,500 calories of digestible energy. Although he didn't eat the entirety of every fish, Otis still likely ate 150 to 200 pounds of salmon and may have consumed 150,000 calories or more. Yeah, so Otis. At Brooks Falls and okay. Katmai National Park. Oh, bear next slide. Okay. Um, Otis eats a lot um, and he doesn't like to expend a whole lot of energy in doing it. Um, then we have 747 an adult male and is probably the largest bear on Brooks River. He's estimated to weigh um, 1,400 pounds. Um, and he is identifiable by this, this low hanging belly that he has, as well as some other things. Um, but he's very round. Uh, then we have 854 divot is an adult female. Um, she's often seen in areas um, along the river corridor where um, this should say where few people gather. She's kind of one of the more, the bear is more wary of, of humans. Um, and she has this nice golden brown coat. She has a circular scar around her neck, which goes back to um, how MPS Rangers and naturalists really only intervene um, in, in very specific scenarios. So she got, got trapped in a, a snare um, and was carrying the snare around, which is why she has the scar and they tranquilized her to remove it. Um, but yeah, she still has that scar, which is a very identifiable feature, which when she gets really fluffy, you can't really see it very well. more bears. We have 856, an adult male. He is also one of the more dominant ba bears. He's very tall. Um, nothing super, super interesting about him. Then we have 901. She's an adult female, one of the younger bears. Um, she has these cute triangle ears with a, a darker face and a lighter muzzle. Um, she's one of our smaller bears, but as you can see, she, she tends to get kind of round as well. 
Um, and then finally, we have the champion of Fat Bear Jr., which is a similar competition that happens in the week before Fat Bear Week, where some of the year's cubs and yearlings are judged. Um, and this is our winner, 909's yearling. When bears are young um, and they first come to the falls with their mom, they aren't given a number because of how drastically they change over, over the years that they they remain with their mother. Um, only after they've dispersed are they given a number and, and studied more closely for those identifying characteristics. Um, she's a two-year-old female cub. Like I said, she's the 2022 Fat Bear Junior Champion. Um, and you can see she's changed quite a bit um, over the months. So we have, we've had two rounds of voting. Um, the third round will start uh, at 11 today. And uh, 856, 335, 909's yearling, and 854 were knocked out. Um, today, we'll have um, 747 go up against 32, Chunk, um, and 164 go up against 435, which is Holly. And then we'll have voting tomorrow, uh, Sunday, and Monday, and then we will get our champion fat bear. When I was reading about the bears um, and and seeing how some some of these bears have weight estimates um, and knowing that they don't often get the bears in hand, and even when they are in hand, they're so large that it's it's fairly difficult to weigh them. Um, I was interested to find out that a couple of years ago in 2019, they actually used LIDAR to scan the bears to estimate their volume. Um, they used a trimble to scan bears at Brooks Falls. Um, five bears got successful scans. Essentially they needed to, for the most part, most of their body needed to be out of the water and they needed to remain still for what seems to us like a short period of time, but when you're looking at an animal, I think I always think about the birds, how the birds never stay still. When you try to look at them, this is a similar situation where they needed to stand still for like 17 seconds in order to get a good scan. So only five of our bears got successful scans, um, but this is how they estimated um, that 747 weighs like 1,400 pounds. Um, Essentially, when you get a scan, you get the volume of the bear. In order to estimate the weight, they need to do some back calculations. So this really is only an estimate. Um, essentially, what they did was um, to use the volume to calculate mass, knowing that bears are about 35% fat, um, which is obviously denser than the rest of their tissues. Um, so this is just a rough estimate. This is what they got. Um, so yeah, 747 volume was about 23.4 feet cubed, which they back calculated density, density times volume equals mass. Um, and so they back calculated that and got about 1400 pounds. But why, why do bears get so fat? Um, you can watch our last video. But why do these bears get so fat in the first place? The simple answer is that they need to put on as much weight as possible to survive the frigid Alaskan winter. The more complex answer still has to do with hibernation, but it also deals with an actual competition between bears and the importance of Katmai's salmon-rich waters and bringing this whole spectacle together. Let's tackle hibernation first. Here's a crash course in that most famous of bear behaviors. Contrary to popular belief, not all bears hibernate. Only in cold climates where winter resources are hard to come by do bears bed down for the long nap. Hibernation is simply a mechanism bears use to conserve energy and wait until food is abundant once again. Even then, not all cold weather bears do this. Polar bears have been known not to hibernate in the winter, despite the lack of food. Also contrary to popular belief, Bears don't sleep for the entire hibernation period. Instead, they go into a sort of low energy state called torpor. 
During this state and throughout the winter, bears can lose up to one third of their body weight, drop their body temperature, slow their heart rate, and don't even eat or drink. But they're not just wasting away in there either. All that fat they accumulated during the summer is burned for energy, allowing them to maintain most of their muscle mass for when they emerge. Bears don't even go to the bathroom during hibernation. Instead, they're able to repurpose their waste into proteins to further prevent muscle decay. And because they're not fully asleep the entire time, they get up and adjust themselves throughout the winter, kind of like your dog does when it's trying to get comfortable. This is thought to help them prevent pressure sores and better retain heat. When temperatures get warmer and food becomes available once again, bears emerge from their dens and start the long, arduous process of survival once again. But So like the uh, video mentioned, the reason these bears are getting so fat is because they need to hibernate, but bears aren't true hibernators. Hibernation involves a lot of very significant physiological changes, primarily a significant drop in body temperature, um, but rather they enter this state of torpor where their, their heart rate slows, um, as well as their breathing and their metabolic rate slows as well. Their temperature drops just a little bit. Um, but in order to prepare, they're eating up to 200 or 20,000 calories a day, or if you're like Otis, 150,000 in a single sitting, um, and essentially to prepare for the winter. So they're eating six months worth of food um, or a year's worth of food in six months time. Um, but they'll enter their dens around this time, um, within the next couple of weeks and go to sleep. Um, like the video mentioned, they don't eat, drink, or excrete waste during this time. They will occasionally wake up and readjust themselves. And this is when cubs are born. Um, the cubs themselves don't enter this state of torpor, um, rather they kind of take care of themselves. Uh, mom is producing milk, so they will feed themselves um, and then emerge from the den with mom when she wakes up. So why, excuse me, why do we care about fat bears? Um, this essentially goes back to the very end of our very first video. We know that lots of salmon and lots of bears equals fat bears. Um, and this is not just a success story of the bears themselves, it is a success story of the ecosystem as a whole. These fat bears indicate to us that the ecosystem is healthy. Um, and one of the main reasons for that is because Pacific salmon are considered a keystone species, um, meaning that they're very integral to the ecosystem. When they're out at sea, they feed birds, marine mammals, us, um, and then as they migrate back, they're feeding, again, more birds, marine mammals, now land mammals, as well as our forests. So this idea of a keystone species comes from, from this, this stone at, at the arch, our keystone, where if you remove that stone, the arch would crumble. Um, the salmon are feeding a lot of species, uh, as well as the ecosystem itself. As they make their way up, they're feeding a lot of animals. Once they die, um, after they have spawned, their bodies are either scavenged by animals or insects, or they'll decompose and contribute back to healthy soils and a healthy forest. So they're very, very important um, in this ecosystem and in a lot of the um, Alaska, Canada, and the Pacific Northwest. Um, ecosystems. So fat bear week is really fun, but remember that fat bears only exist because of clean water and, and healthy ecosystems. All right, that's all I've got.